Hello and welcome to Cunicore Weekly. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. It's time for the Hydrolator. It's time for the Hydrolator. Oh, wait, wait, I'm getting my swim shunks on right now. Hold on. It's time for Dizzy History. We welcome you to the Living Seas. We welcome you to Sea Base Alpha. And with those words, we were transported to a world under the sea. Unfortunately, not a world filled with singing crustaceans and redheaded mermaids, but that's, that's reserved for cartoons. I'm talking about the real deal, a living, breathing sea base teeming with life and research. That's right, and amazingly enough, it all took place at Epcot. Well, maybe we weren't exactly under the sea, but amazing things did happen there long before computer-generated fish swam in to stake their claim. <laughs> I almost said clam. And it all took place at the Living Seas. Nice play on words there. Although the Living Seas was designed by Imagineers, they had a team of oceanographers, marine biologists, and other experts to help them create an undersea world on dry land. Before it was surpassed by the Georgia Aquarium in 2005, the Living Seas boasted the world's largest artificial saltwater tank, containing over 70 species of aquatic life swimming in a 5.6 million gallons of seawater. The main coral reef is just about 203 feet in diameter and 27 feet deep. The original pavilion had you enter a queue decorated with various props from the 1954 film 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. At the end, you were ushered into a theater for a seven-minute film about the mysteries of the oceans and how they affect our lives in ways we might not yet have imagined. If you remember this film, it's probably because of the infamous line, and it rained. And rained. And rained. And rained. <laughs> when the film was over, you were taken to the hydrolators. These capsules, air quotes again, would descend, air quotes again, to the ocean floor using an effect which made it appear as though you were actually descending. Outside the hydrolator's window, a conveyor belt painted with rocks moved upward along with bubbles and the floor shook a little bit. You put it all together and you had a really realistic illusion that the hydrolator was taking you down into the ocean depths. In fact, it was even rumored to have been part of a lawsuit as someone claimed going down to the ocean floor ruptured their eardrums. Yeah. That wasn't me. Uh, anyway, from there, you boarded sea cabs for the short trip to Sea Base Alpha. These cabs followed the same track through the aquarium as today's Nemo ride, but with one slight difference. Instead of Nemo and his friends popping up during your journey, the sea cabs took you through a tunnel with the coral reef visible through six inch thick windows. Just upon arrival at Sea Base Alpha, you were encouraged to explore this underwater research facility. You can watch another film about harnessing ocean, oceanic resources, check out the many exhibits, view demonstrations in the airlock, or watch divers perform studies on the coral reef from a breathtaking two-story viewing area. The Living Seas exemplified one of Walt Disney's early philosophies, disguise learning as fun. They say that what goes up must come down, but the opposite applied here. When you left Sea Base Alpha, you had to ride the hydrolators to return, uh, air quotes, to the surface. While in the hydrolator, you could look up to the glass ceiling, more air quotes, to see the water surface come into view from above. In 1998, the Living Seas lost its sponsor, United Technologies, who had been financing the exhibit since it opened in 1986. Without a sponsor, the pavilion began to decay. The sea camps were stopped in 2001, and eventually the hydrolators became optional. You no longer had to ride them to reach Sea Base Alpha. But without the hydrolators, the illusion of entering an undersea world was lost. With the success of the Disney Pixar's Finding Nemo film, Disney decided to revitalize its dying pavilion by adding characters that the kids knew and loved. In late 2006, the Living Seas became The Seas with Nemo and Friends. The new ride uses the same track as the sea cabs, though now slightly lengthened. These new clammobiles also face sideways, but the sea cabs face forward. Disney also added the popular show Turtle Talk with Crush as part of its Living Character Initiative. In what is quite possibly now the highlight of the pavilion, guests are brought into the human tank to interact with Crush using cameras placed throughout the room and a live actor backstage playing the role of Crush. Wait a minute. 
I thought that was a real turtle. Uh, anyway, the Seas is also home to one of the nicest restaurants on Disney property, the Coral Reef, where you can enjoy a meal surrounded by stunning underwater views of the Caribbean Coral Reef and the fish you might get to eat. Yummy. Well, if you happen to be an experienced and certified scuba diver, you can experience the reef from the other side of the glass. This special attraction lasts about three hours and includes a behind the seas tour. See what I did there? Behind Ooh, the seas? Ooh. Nice. Behind the scenes tour of the aquarium, a guided underwater tour of the reef, and some free time for you to explore the tank yourself. Though the educational aspect of the pavilion has been reduced, the seas still provides some unique learning experiences, as well as an up-close look at what goes on beneath the water's surface. He's a nerd, he's a, nerd. He's a, geek. He's a geek, but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech, ah. it's George's Book of the Week. The Making of Disney's Animal Kingdom by Melody Malberg was published in 1998. For Animal Kingdom fans, there isn't a lot of published information that focuses on the theme park. Malmberg's book is a rare gem for several reasons. It is an in-depth look at the creation of the park, a thorough look at the team, the political process, and environmental issues, and most importantly, it is one of the few resources that looks at the step-by-step -step development of a Disney theme park. How it grew from a small team led by Joe Road to a cast of thousands. This book reflects the animal kingdom in so many ways. The park was shepherded by Imagineer Joe Road, who had the vision and the desire to keep the project moving forward. Miss Malmberg was able to collect the stories of the Imagineers, follow their progress, and take us behind the scenes of the park. She interviewed key people that were there from the beginning, Joe Road, Rick Barangi, and Zofia Kosturko. You get the feeling that you were there, day by day, watching as they create the park. You learn early on that the Imagineers knew they needed one thing to make the park a success. Their rallying cry was, proximity equals excitement. During one budget and planning meeting, the Imagineers, unbeknown even to Marty Sklar, brought in a 400-pound female Bengal tiger that walked around the conference room while Rody spoke. The executives got the point and let the group move forward. They were able to try and develop new means of getting the guests close to the animals, safely of course. You get a detailed look at how the art, or the building's details, interiors, roofs, painting, was constructed using as many local and foreign talents as available. Sculptors, thatchers, and artisans were brought in from all over the world. Momberg spends a lot of time looking at the backstage care and living areas. Since Disney was creating a park that would, inevitably, be compared to a zoo, there is a focus on how Disney treats the animals. The first two animals to arrive, the giraffes, Miles and Zari, were greeted with tears and cheers. Momber goes into great detail explaining how the animals were procured, transported, and acclimated to the park. The book is filled with photos, artwork, and concept drawings. One of the final sections looks at the next few years of the Animal Kingdom. In 1998, Asia was the next land planned, with the River Ride and the Maharaja Jungle Trek opening first. And they talk about the possibility of a new hotel called the Animal Kingdom Lodge, with Savannah Views. The very last section is a listing of all the Imagineers that worked on the Animal Kingdom. Eight pages of names. The park has definitely come a long way in ten years. You know, I really hope they get around to building that Animal Kingdom Lodge. Sounds like it would be a good idea. It might be a nice place to stay. Lots of animals running around and, you know, acting like butlers. I would stay there, as long as they wear tuxedos. If they don't wear tuxedos, I'm out. Eh, uh, they'll just bring in penguins. You'll never know the difference. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. It's a debate. Who's gonna win it? Uh, we've talked about this in private a few times, and I think we probably need to air this in public now. But I really like Soren. And I really don't. I think we have to get this out in the open a little bit. So what what about Soren do you like exactly? Explain it to me. All right, let me try. Let me try. I'll, I'll speak very slowly and use small words. <clears throat> I know you're going to hit me the next time you see me. But anyways, in my mind... Epcot needs more signature attractions. It needs bigger, explosive attractions, stuff that's exciting, it's going to drag people in. 
and try to educate them if you can. But you know, today people just want to have fun. They want to have a good time. So I think they needed something like this. It's a gay buster attraction, lines of two hours. It's got to be doing something right, you know? Uh, it, it, and it does have, I know one of your arguments is going to be it's not really an Epcot attraction like Horizon or World of Motion, but nothing is. But it does have some tenuous and noticeable ties to Horizon, of course, with the, the smell of orange that gets wafted across. And, you know, it's got, it, it makes you feel good after you leave. And, you know, Jeff, when it comes down to it, my kids absolutely love the ride, so that does it for me. You know, I, I hear, I hear what you're saying, and I but, respect but, your but opinions. But you're not listening. Yeah, I, I'm oh, listening. Okay. I okay. hear okay. it. The problem is you're wrong. That's it. <laughs> you're just, you're just wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate the fact that it, you know it's a gatebuster attraction. I get that. I disagree with the fact that it's in the land. A ride like Soren has no business being in a pavilion that has to do with agriculture and stuff like that. It's completely misplaced. Um, I don't think it's a very exciting ride for the three hour wait times that it has. I have a lot more fun playing with all the interactive features online than I do on the ride itself. It's a glorified motion simulator. Um, you know, it, it maybe this is part of the purest in me, but it also replaced one of my favorite attractions and that was, you know, Food Rocks. Uh, and kitchen, you know, kitchen cabaret it was in that area there, and and you know, I don't know. I just get so bored. I know everybody likes it, and I tried really hard to like it the first couple of times, and I just I cannot get into it. I just feel like I'm in a giant, you know, erector set, and I'm flying, and everyone around me going, "Oh, this is so much fun," and I'm like, "This is boring." Great, well, I can smell oranges. If I wanted to smell oranges, I'd buy an orange. If I wanted to see Michael Eisner hit a golf ball, I'd go to Santa Monica. What, what, I, what I, you I, know, I was I was going to bring that up. I mean, you get to see Michael Eisner in an actual Disney attraction. What could be better than that? Um, actually seeing Michael Eisner. Oh, okay, that's true. That's true. So I guess you know everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Uh, uh, I mean, yours is right wrong, obviously, wrong. but. Uh, Jeff, 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 poor Jeff. So. So can we just agree to disagree on this one? I think we'll have to. Okay, agree to disagree, and you're wrong. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. There is one section of Disney's Animal Kingdom that is known for its uh, extinction. Uh, do you mean Donald Land, USA? Was my pun that obvious? No, it's actually just in the script. I was just reading ahead. Oh, oh, oh well. Uh, well, if you head into Restaurant Osaurus in Dinoland USA, you are more than likely to get lost in the details if you take the chance and look up. The restaurant is themed to look like a commissary and dorm for the students of the Dino Institute. Over the years, they decorated it, with, you know, their area based on their um, obsession, if you will. Yeah, if you start to look around, you will notice that the students have taken to adding the word Asaurus to the ends of uh, the end of signs, logos, and names. So the next time you're there, take a look around. Yeah, take a look around Asaurus. And this week's shout out goes to Holly Wetzel because I'm hungry and your name rhymes with pretzel. And if you're in any way related to Wetzel's pretzels, hook us up. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to leave us a comment, email us, like us on Facebook, Asaurus. Oh, good. Follow us on Twitter, Asaurus. You can still enter our fantastically fuzzy photo contest, Asaurus. I don't know work out so much, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, I'm George, Asaurus. And I'm Jeff, Asaurus. And we're from Mice Chat, Asaurus. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week on Communicore Weekly, Asaurus. Orange bird frenzy. <laughs>